uh, very good morning to everyone. So I hope all of you must be very safe and doing good at your home. And I am Vijay Soni from Corona Cures and from Cypreneur. And all of you must be having so many questions about uh, uh, coronavirus and, uh, and about this pandemic. And uh, therefore, we invited Dr. Rahul Roy, who is an assistant professor at uh, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And his lab leads the, uh, an interdisciplinary research program that aims to innovate and engineer novel technologies to understand and manage infectious diseases using single cell, single molecule detection, single cell analysis, quantitative genomics, and high resolution imaging. So in today's talk, he will actually talk about the roadmap of coronavirus. And this will include the life cycle of coronavirus, host immune response uh, to the infection, and some unanswered question for a better treatment and research. So by chance, if you have any question, then please write in the, the uh, Zoom chat box. I am sure most of you must be aware of that. And we will for sure try our best to answer that by the end of the talk. And uh, if you want to uh, talk directly to the, um, to the speaker, then we can unmute you and you can directly talk to the, um, uh, to in the, after the talk. So I, now I would like to request Dr. Rahul to start the talk. Thank you, Dr. Rahul. Rahul. Uh, thank you, Vijay. Uh, and, and, and thank you for inviting me, both uh, Vijay and Priyanka. And for uh, uh, Corona Cures for organizing these webinars, apart from the wonderful uh, articles that you have been putting together on your website, uh, I really enjoyed reading some of those. So uh, it's great to see uh, a lot of folks getting interested in doing virus research, uh, which is what I do in chemical engineering, uh, even though I am an engineer by training. And the reason um, I, I do that uh, is uh, motivated by uh, this picture. So uh, RNA viruses um, have been um, around uh, as human pathogens for many, many uh, years. Uh, and uh, one of the last pandemics uh, happened uh, in about, we just celebrated the centenary of that uh, two years back. Uh, and uh, even at that time, uh, we um, did not have any cures for it. We did not uh, know at that time what hit us. Uh, we could only identify uh, that it was a virus that was causing the infection. But uh, even now, we don't know the exact sequence of the Spanish flu virus that hit uh, all of Europe, America, and in India uh, in 1980. The situation hasn't really changed too much. Uh, so this is 100 years for, fast forward. Uh, and even now, uh, we knew, uh, the people who study viruses uh, in general knew that if we had a pandemic strain of a virus, we would have very little opportunities to uh, control it because of the fact that uh, global travel, in spite of our health conditions and our health care facilities have increased much better, have become much better. We don't have active uh, uh, efforts to find these viruses and come up with strategies to uh, quickly come up with therapeutics for them, come up with vaccines for them in an accelerated fashion. So uh, now you already know where we stand uh, in terms of uh, fighting RNA viruses. And uh, if I show you this, um, graph, uh, this schematic depicts the different RNA viruses uh, that we already know very, very well. Uh, and uh, RNA viruses are divided into many different families um, on, in which uh, double stranded RNA viruses, uh, which are two strands of RNA, just like the double strands of DNA, uh, they would have the complementary strands annealed to it. Uh, partner, and uh, we would have the viruses like the rotavirus, which causes dysentery and, and, and diarrhea in kids all the time. 
Then we have uh, single standard RNA viruses, which uh, are in two major groups. Uh, one is the uh, negative strand RNA viruses, uh, which uh, carry uh, quite a few pathogens, uh, and, uh, including measles. And, and then there's uh, the positive strand RNA viruses, which form a very large number of um, uh, human pathogens. Uh, and uh, it starts all the way from HIV, which is an RNA virus, which then uh, converts itself into a DNA form, integrates into your genomes. So that's shown here. Um, So that's shown here. And then uh, we have a very large class of uh, mosquito and uh, tick-borne viruses, uh, including uh, dengue virus, West Nile virus, yellow fever virus, uh, hepatitis, uh, then chikungunya, uh, names that you are very familiar with. Uh, here's polio virus for you, the enteroviruses. And then uh, something that you have become very, very familiar with, uh, are these uh, coronaviruses, so SARS um, and MERS and the recent uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, or coronavirus 2. So uh, I will discuss their structures in a little bit, but as you can see, RNA viruses form a bulk of the human pathogens and uh, we are still struggling with uh, finding vaccines and drugs um, for, uh, so many of these that I mentioned uh, do not have vaccines, for example, HIV, um, dengue, and chikungunya have no vaccines till date uh, that are commercially available. And, and many of the others where vaccines have existed uh, because of uh, anti-vaccine uh, protests and, and uh, uh, we have not been able to vaccinate everybody that we need to. So we are seeing a resurgence of uh, many of these. And then this I wanted to put in perspective uh, because even if you are able to cure and, and come up with the therapeutics for uh, COVID-2, uh, we have still a long way to go where we can control these uh, RNA virus uh, based uh, human diseases. So uh, coronaviruses, uh, the star of today's talk, uh, are um, uh, positive strand RNA viruses. What it means is that the strand of the RNA that is encoded, that forms the genome of the virus, that is uh, capable of generating the protein by itself. Uh, uh, it only needs the ribosome to do that. Uh, so it encodes the, it's the encoding, uh, protein encoding strand. And um, coronaviruses form very large genomes for uh, positive strand RNA viruses, uh, because RNA viruses in general, uh, RNA itself is a very, not a very stable genome. For that uh, matter, um, about uh, 30 or close to 30 KB long uh, positive strand of the RNA is a relatively difficult strand to keep uh, stable. Yet uh, we, uh, these viruses have uh, evolved over the uh, ages and uh, they form a, uh, 120 nanometer um, uh, structure, uh, which is mostly uh, decorated with the most more now most famous famously identified spikes that you can also see in the electronic uh, electron uh, microscope uh, micrograph shown here in the right. Uh, apart from uh, the spike protein, uh, which basically binds to the receptors, they, you also have uh, two other proteins which are uh, embedded in a lipid membrane which has been derived from the host cells itself. Uh, they are called the nucleo, uh, sorry, the envelope protein and the, um, the M protein, the membrane protein. And then apart from that, there is a set of proteins that are called nucleocapsid proteins that bind to the genomic uh, strand of the RNA and uh, encapsulate it inside this uh, structure. Uh, these are the only proteins that are available uh, when the virus uh, kind of finds these cells. Uh, and I'll quickly describe uh, what the rest of the genome does. Okay. Coronaviruses are also uh, not old, they uh, not dramatically old, but they have existed in the, uh, in the human uh, infection cycle. We get infected by 
at them uh, every year, about 10 to 30% of common cold cases are in fact uh, uh, caused by coronaviruses. And we have two major classes of coronaviruses called the alpha and the beta, and both of them cause human infections. Um, uh, in spite of the fact that these are uh, RNA viruses uh, and uh, have low fidelity of, um, uh, uh, of replication, uh, they have a surprisingly low mutation rate. Uh, for example, the strain uh, isolate called OC43 uh, has had um, only two mutations in the amino acid in its uh, genome uh, over the last 40 years or so. Okay, so it tells you that it's a relatively stable, it, it doesn't mutate like the flu, uh, and ha it has implications for uh, what kind of, uh, 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 wh what it means for vaccine design and development. Um, it also transfers very quickly uh, uh, from, uh, from other animals to humans. Uh, and uh, here are examples of the three famous cases of coronaviruses. So the SARS, uh, first coronavirus that was recognized um, was uh, identified to have transferred from bats to humans and kibbits. And this happened in 2003. Uh, we have had another jump over event, uh, or we call it the spillover event, which happened in the MERS coronavirus, which was identified to be coming from the camels um, and happened in 2011. And then uh, the recent uh, uh, while we haven't been able to identify um, uh, the exact animal reservoir for uh, the coronavirus 2, uh, it is commonly and um, popularly believed that it jumped from bats to some intermediate animal and from that to humans uh, that happened um, somewhere in 2019. And that's the current dates as they stand. Okay. So um, I want to highlight the life cycle of the coronavirus because that will kind of uh, set the stage for uh, how people are going about, coming about uh, uh, different kinds of interventions and therapeutics for the coronaviruses. So um, what you see here is how a virus like coronavirus, in fact, many of the RNA viruses that I talked about earlier, they follow something very, very similar, uh, infect a cell. Okay, so the virus comes in from uh, the outside uh, and then it uses a receptor of some kind. Um, uh, it basically uses a receptor to uh, bind to the surface of the cell. Uh, in coronaviruses, uh, SARS-1 and SARS-2 coronaviruses, uh, ACE2 receptor uh, has been um, identified as the key receptor for binding of the coronavirus. Upon binding, uh, it has two uh, pathways. Uh, one is where it un gets under undergoes uh, endocytosis, uh, and uh, in these endosomes, uh, as the pH um, basically drops, uh, the um, protease is present on the membrane, uh, the, uh, the on the of the membranes of the endosomes basically cleave off the spike protein which is the uh, big uh, globular spikes that you saw before and then activates this for a process called the membrane fusion they contain their own membrane uh, and the membrane of the endosomes fuse together uh, such that the um, the rna genomic rna is now uh, able to uh, get transmitted to the cytoplasm of the cell uh, the alternate approach that uh, the virus takes is to uh, fuse its cells into the plasma membrane of the cell directly without going into the endosomes. And that happens uh, in association between the ACE2 uh, receptor as well as the uh, TMPRSS2 uh, protease, which uh, can cleave the spike and then uh, allow this to happen. Once it gets inside the cell, the um, Genomes are uh, uh, are converted into uh, uh, the the genome is basically uh, translated by the uh, the host machinery uh, and uh, the host ribosomes basically will make the uh, non-structural proteins. These are the proteins that are important for 
making copies, more copies of the viral genome. And these proteins, which include the helicase, the, the proteases that cleave off uh, these proteins, because these proteins are generated as a polyprotein, a single protein that is cleaved over at different places, uh, at different uh, cleavage sites, and allows these proteins to fold and then start um, uh, replicating. So these uh, replicase proteins will now assemble and then start the replication of the uh, genome. This first starts by creation of what is called the negative strand, basically the template. And that template is now used further um, to generate several subgenomic copies of the virus. And of course, the full genome is generated, which is also uh, goes and uh, associates with the next round of translation that happens of the structural protein. So these are these proteins that you saw on the surface of the uh, virus, the spike proteins one and two, the membrane protein and the envelope protein and the nucleic acid protein. These assembled together in the uh, Golgi and the ER. Uh, and then um, this membrane from the Golgi kinds of forms the outer layer of the uh, virus, which eventually buds off, okay? So to be able to, uh, uh, do all these processes as you could imagine. This only doesn't require the um, viral proteins, but also the host proteins. And uh, this gives us the opportunity to come at different stages of this viral replication cycle or the life cycle of the coronavirus and come up with uh, inhibitors which will stop any of these processes. So for example, we uh, from other coronaviruses or other RNA viruses, uh, we have uh, relatively broad um, inhibitors to stop any of these processes, uh, which uh, are being tried as we speak as treatments for uh, the coronavirus too. So for example, uh, you can have uh, uh, inhibitors of so some famous ones that you know of, uh, are the ones which kind of prevent this uh, change in pH in this uh, endosome, uh, hydroxychloroquine and the chloroquine family of class of drugs basically do this. Uh, and that's why uh, they have been proposed as one way to uh, come up with treatment and even prophylactic for uh, uh, against coronavirus. Uh, then uh, there are other famous ones like the uh, ones which inhibit the replication process. So this would include uh, remdesivir and flavip Piravir, which, uh, which are and uh, ritonavir and uh, lipo, uh, 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 lipo, um, lipo, uh, which are helicase inhibitors or, or protease inhibitors or uh, RDRP inhibitors, allergenic polymerase inhibitors. Okay, and then there are host uh, protease inhibitors uh, like the furin protease inhibitors uh, that are also used, and then there's uh, some class of drugs which also prevent the release of the virus. On this. These are all broad uh, uh, drugs which have previously shown effect on other RNA viruses and are being now tried there. So I'll give you a quick example of it. Now, of course, that was the general uh, coronavirus. Uh, of course, uh, late last year, uh, we saw uh, the, the spillover of coronavirus 2 uh, into the human population and starting from Wuhan in China, of course, it has spread all over the world. I don't need to convince you. Uh, if you haven't been uh, not hiding in a cave, you all know about this. And uh, currently, we have about uh, 100,000 cases every day, uh, and it has kind of saturated. It's not uh, that countries are not able to cope with it or are not able to uh, suppress the spread of it. Uh, so many countries like uh, uh, the really uh, very large uh, burden of the disease in many of the European countries, but they are showing um, uh, uh, decrease in the daily numbers that are uh, going on. So Spain, Italy, Germany, France, all of them, uh, the curves are uh, what we call flattening. And, uh, but we still have uh, countries like India and, and Brazil, as you can see in this bottom panel, which are still going up and we don't know when we will be able to uh, come up uh, with interventions which stop the spread of this. And of course, this doesn't include uh, uh, this uh, United States, which has already uh, 1.5 million cases. And 
uh, still we haven't had a chance where we are seeing the tip over where uh, the infections, uh, the total number of infections start to saturate. Um, this is to give you a very quick idea about uh, the origin of the virus. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, we can sequence uh, the viruses and then assign them to uh, different class or clades of uh, the virus. And uh, this allows us to identify the possible origins of the virus. So uh, MERS uh, coronavirus, for example, uh, uh, is here. Uh, and you will see that uh, a very related uh, sequence of a MERS virus has been found in camels. So we suspect that the spillover happened from camels. Uh, the original uh, coronavirus basically is here. Uh, these strains uh, are very closely related to bat coronaviruses. And within this same family, uh, we have our new um, COVID-2 coronavirus, uh, which uh, the closest relative that we have been able to find is again a bat coronavirus. So between the SARS-1 and SARS-2, we have about 80% uh, similarity. Uh, so they are quite distant relatives, uh, but between the bat coronavirus, which is uh, the RATG13 bat coronavirus, uh, we have about a 96% similarity. So we believe that uh, bats were the origin of the uh, coronavirus, though it might have jumped through a few other animals before it has come us. So what makes SARS-CoV-2 so different from any of the other viruses? We have had SARS viruses before and they are listed in the right hand side of this panel uh, and uh, there are a few numbers that I would like to highlight here which will kind of give you uh, an impression for how uh, virologists and epidemiologists think about this. So uh, one number that is uh, commonly used is the R0. This is called the basic reproductive number. This number tells you uh, an, uh, an average indication of how often would someone infected with this particular virus go on to infect another individual. So if uh, the, the um, reproductive number is one or larger, then you propagate the infection because you infect more people than uh, yourself. And, and then it kind of grows like a mushroom, right? Whereas if the reproductive number can be brought down to less than one, then you can uh, imagine that this, num uh, this kind of extinguishes itself because there are a lot less people getting infected in the upcoming rounds. Now, if you compare this uh, to the common similar viruses, uh, MERS and, 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 and flu have a reproductive, basic reproductive number which is smaller than this. Um, but uh, SARS, uh, first SARS, actually had the number which is larger than this. Um, if you look at also the case fatality rate, um, the, both the MERS and the SARS um, were uh, much larger, so about 10% for SARS and 35% for MERS was the fatality rate. So that's the basically uh, people dying for every infection that you have, the percentage of people dying for an infection that you have. We estimate currently uh, this for COVID-19 to be anywhere, in between, anywhere between two to 3%. And uh, this number is slightly old, uh, which is higher than flu, but much, much smaller than SARS and MERS. And we believe the difference between the two, uh, uh, this class of viruses, the SARS viruses versus the, uh, the COVID-19 is uh, got to do with the difference in the incubation time. Uh, first of all, it uh, resides in the humans for a much, much longer period of time. Uh, that's, so it gives you an opportunity to infect a lot more people, but also uh, it is asymptomatic for a very large number of uh, cases, uh, for a very large period within this period. So you wouldn't know that you are infected and you go on to infect uh, uh, other people. Uh, while you are, uh, and you can travel a lot more and even travel since uh, 2003 has increased much more than before. So uh, we believe that's one of the reasons why it has been able to spread so far so quickly. Um, and uh, while everything else remains similar, it is nowhere close to flu uh, in terms of uh, its, uh, its uh, ability to propagate to 
the population. So uh, annual infected uh, global numbers for flu are of the order of 1 billion. Uh, we still don't know. Our numbers could stand anywhere between 10 million to uh, 50 million, depending on uh, how quickly we are able to come up with interventions. Uh, but the uh, hospitalization rate and the high fatality rate uh, means that you will hear a lot more people dying from it, uh, at least equivalent to flu, if not uh, more uh, than flu. Okay, so uh, it wouldn't be surprising if uh, you would know somebody who has had COVID-19 symptoms. Um, we have about uh, four out of five cases are asymptomatic, uh, which means that they um, develop very, very mild symptoms, so you, people don't even notice them. Uh, but the people who do develop symptoms uh, will show uh, fever, that's very common, uh, loss of appetite and fatigue, but there are other symptoms that have been uh, found to be associated with it, which is loss of smell, the shortness of breath, um, coughing, uh, and muscle aches. And then if you end up in a severe form of the disease, which we don't know what uh, are the um, associated factors for those, but you will see slightly severe uh, uh, symptoms like difficulty in walking, uh, coughing up blood, extreme chest pains, and, and very large drops in uh, uh, the WBCs, which will compromise your ability to fight other infections as well. Okay. Uh, what has been surprising uh, and an indicator of some way uh, how the disease is affecting and killing people uh, is this age uh, dependence. So the percentage of fatalities uh, is steadily increases as you are older. Uh, this is not true for influenza uh, flu viruses because they are relatively flat across this whole uh, curve. But we find that the coronavirus to the older you are, the higher you are at risk. So for people who are greater than 80, uh, they have as high as a 50% fatality rate, okay? It is also true that uh, if you are uh, uh, associate, you basically have a pre-existing condition like a cardiovascular disease, you have a much higher percentage uh, of fatality rate. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you are a healthy person um, um, and with no uh, symptoms like uh, these comorbidities, then you would uh, actually have a very small 0.9% uh, fatality rate. Uh, interestingly, we also have found, and when I say we, the community has found, that um, the males are much more uh, susceptible uh, to fatality by coronavirus, about almost twice as much. Um, um, and we don't know what in biology causes this. So uh, things we still don't have answers to. So uh, I promise a roadmap. Um, so this is uh, how I see it and many others in the community see it, uh, this. So the short term uh, plans or short term mitigation plans were mostly non-pharmacological because we didn't understand what was the causing agent, how, um, how uh, what we didn't understand the disease. The best we had was the last coronavirus infection, the SARS coronavirus infection. The most of our knowledge comes from that. But uh, there were a very small number of cases, about uh, less than 10,000 cases. So uh, we, we didn't get a chance to study it well enough, uh, in, a, in a sense. So uh, these non-pharmacological interventions uh, is what you have been seeing. We, the idea is to limit human to human transmission, reduce the secondary infections uh, among close contacts, healthcare workers, prevent transmission uh, amplification and super spreading events like you have been seeing in the news and uh, prevent further spread as much as possible. Okay, this is only buying time. Um, if you, your numbers are small, you identify, isolate and care for patients early so that they don't end up with the severe form of the disease as the disease progresses. Uh, you detect them uh, early enough and you provide uh, as, be as best as you can optimize care for them. Uh, for these, you of course need to have diagnostic tools and that's what the most of the focus has been initially. So uh, quantitative reverse transcription based PCR tests, uh, antigen based tests and antibody based tests. I will discuss a few of those, uh, how they work, um, have been developed and uh, are being developed as we speak and uh, hopefully we will be able to test everybody going forward. Um, 
We also want to reduce transmission from other sources. As you saw, these viruses infect um, um, animals easily. Uh, so you have to be careful when you are around animals uh, because they might, might be themselves carriers and this can affect uh, can have up among the animal population as well. Uh, there are other um, unknowns. We don't understand clinical severity. What causes the clinically severe form of the disease? What is it associated with apart from the uh, basic things that I showed you? We don't understand it at the molecular level. We need to uh, do that. We need to also understand the level of extent of transmission and infection so that we can really uh, uh, contain the infection and we of course have to work on treatment options and this is what has been going on. Uh, uh, I will quickly go through the diagnostic approaches. Many of you uh, who work on molecular biology probably know about these methods. So quantitative uh, reverse transcription PCR is the gold standard and the current method of testing everywhere. This was possible because we could sequence the genome quite early in this infection uh, of the virus was isolated and sequenced. That was possible because of the sequencing technologies that exist. The samples usually are nasal swabs, pharyngeal swabs, sputum, feces, all of these contain the virus, uh, including the saliva. So that's why uh, you wear a mask because when you're speaking, you basically throw the virus on at others. Uh, what you do is you detect the virus, uh, viral RNA, which is converted into uh, DNA using reverse transcription, then PCR amplified, and then detected using specific probes called TACMAN probes or molecular beacons, which convert a fluorescent signal. That's what mostly is the testing that is being done. And uh, you detect uh, different parts of the genome, the RDRP helicase, gene or the spike gene or the nucleic acid genes. Uh, and the sensitivity is, is extremely good. You can detect as low as 10 copies of the viral RNA uh, and as low as one to five copies of the infectious uh, virus particles. They have some challenges. Some, um, they are labor intensive. They require fancy reagents uh, and, and equipments, uh, which has been a limiting factor for the testing facilities. This was not the standard uh, diagnostics. Uh, so that's why India has been slightly slow in get, coming up to speed with this. Uh, and there are other methods, uh, simpler variants of uh, nucleic acid-based tests that are being developed, some methods which use isothermal uh, conditions. So one single temp uh, temperature is enough. So uh, one famous method which has been uh, employed a lot is the uh, loop-mediated isothermal amplification uh, called LAM. Uh, and then there are detection methods. Instead of using these TACMAN probes, there are other probes being developed uh, which will work at room temperature or close to room temperature, uh, which are CRISPR uh, CAS based uh, methods. And I have listed them here. Uh, you are most welcome to look up the uh, references listed here. Apart from that, uh, what hasn't come in a big way uh, are the antigen detection tests where you detect the viral proteins. So there is no need for amplification. Um, they would be mostly targeting spike and nucleic acid proteins uh, or a combination of a few proteins like the um, proteases, the two proteases that the uh, virus makes. Uh, you, you end up using most of the time uh, recombinant antibodies and that is the challenge. We haven't had a chance to make these recombinant antibodies. They are slowly coming into the market and as they do, uh, these antigen te detection tests will become available. They will be faster, uh, but they will be lower in sensitivity. So you will again go for a quantitative RT-PCR to confirm in many cases. Um, while uh, um, we are um, working at these things, we also have to come up with midterm interventions. These are not permanent cures, but these are um, strategies to um, uh, come up with treatment uh, when there is none. And one approach has been repurposing of approved and preclinical drugs. Um, so uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, sulfate or HCQ uh, is an anti-malarial drug that I discussed earlier that interferes with the endosomal uptake and the uh, pH, it basically perturbs the pH of these uh, compartments. Uh, and then prevents the activation of the spike protein. So um, this has been uh, in the news quite a bit, including the uh, uh, India uh, approving its use for the healthcare workers as well as uh, uh, US uh, uh, president kind of uh, proposing it to uh, many of their staff. 
And um, the verdict on this, uh, I have kind of put the reference in there, is ambiguous. It's not very clear if it really makes an impact. So we will have to wait and watch and see how, uh, whether we have an ambiguous answer for this. The other drug is the remdesivir, which is also in the news quite a bit. <laughs> uh, it's a uh, nucleoside uh, triphosphate analog. Uh, basically, it's a, similar to the kind of HIV drugs that you use. It was originally developed uh, first for hepatitis, then was tried on Ebola. Uh, and uh, it didn't work there as well as it, they thought. But um, it has been uh, shown to be mildly promising. And I say uh, mildly because the data is very preliminary. But you are, again, welcome to see the results in there. So. Um, um, this is being um, also uh, worked at, and, and, and the drug is already in multiple clinical trials, uh, including one by WHO. Another uh, combination of drugs, uh, lopinavir uh, with ritinavir, uh, is a, a HIV protease inhibitor uh, that has been approved in a few countries. Uh, again, uh, the data for the drug combination by itself is ambiguous. But a uh, more recent uh, study where it was used in combination with interferons. So interferons are these type one interferons are these uh, uh, proteins, native uh, uh, innate immune response proteins, um, which are produced by the cells, but can be also given uh, extragenously. And they have shown uh, some good promise uh, in uh, reducing the symptoms in mild form of the disease. So uh, again, references for those are added. And there are a few others which I can't discuss because the list goes on and on. About 200 uh, drugs like this are currently in some state of trials uh, and we'll probably see them in, in, going in the future. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, the human, human immune response is uh, important to understand if I'm, I'm going to say, tell you about anything about um, how vaccines work, which is a lot of questions that we saw. And uh, as you would imagine, I told you that there's an innate immune response as the virus tries to infect the uh, interferon response is the cytokines that are released by the uh, innate immune cells. Uh, and as well as the NK cells, they are broad, they, uh, but they do their job. They also uh, activate the adaptive immune response, the B cell based, uh, uh, antibody based uh, immunity, as well as the uh, cell based, um, the T cell based uh, immunity, uh, which then goes on to uh, kind of remove infected cells. And they do it by several strategies. I'm not going to go into all the details, uh, but the basic idea is the B cells release antibodies that kind of bind to the virus and neutralize the virus from binding to the, uh, the intended target cells. And the T cells basically kill infected cells by releasing enzymes into it and, and activating these other B cells. Okay. So both are important. Early innate immune immunity uh, is important for not only uh, controlling the initial phase of the virus infection, but also early innate immunity is important for uh, triggering the adaptive immunity, which is a long-term uh, memory of our immune response. So uh, the serology tests that I was mentioning uh, allow us to measure this by looking for antibodies which are specific to the viral antigens. Uh, so uh, you can develop them against any of the viral proteins now that we have the sequences or many of these. And uh, what they show uh, is um, that within uh, 10 days, uh, you will have antibody responses. The IgG uh, responses usually take about a little longer than 10 days, but uh, within 20 days or so, almost all uh, individuals seem to be uh, converting, or we call uh, the phrase we use is seroconverting, uh, means that they are developing antibodies against the viruses. Okay, and this happens roughly the same uh, for IgM, which are slightly early, uh, but it seems in coronavirus uh, too, they happen roughly at the same uh, time frame. Um, if you look at the RNA virus, uh, uh, they are present in all these, uh, so that's in the panel B. Uh, but uh, 
In the lower respiratory tract, uh, this exists for a slightly longer period of time, whereas in the upper respiratory tract, this load very, very quickly goes uh, to uh, undetectable uh, levels in any people uh, beyond the first 15 days or so. Okay. Uh, what people have also been able to do is show that, uh, in general, there is a very uh, robust T cell response. Uh, about 100% of the people infected with the coronavirus develop uh, CD4, which is one of the T cells, uh, helper T cells, uh, and are able to identify the viral proteins, whereas uh, about 70% of the people are able to develop the CD8, which is the cytotoxic form of the um, uh, immune response um, if you have an infection with SARS-CoV-2. The other thing that people found is that even the common cold coronaviruses, which are distinctly relative, uh, they themselves, if you, if you, even if you haven't had a SARS-CoV-2 infection, many of uh, uh, the population, uh, up to 50% of them will recognize, the, uh, have CD4s which will recognize SARS-CoV-2, and about 20% of them would already have CD8. So it's, it might be that you might be immune to, uh, or at least you will be less susceptible to infection uh, by coronavirus too, in case you have something like this. So this is an important study in that regard. Um, one thing that, um, that I want to emphasize is the, um, the virus, uh, by itself uh, causes damage, uh, cell uh, lysis, apoptosis, pyroptosis. Um, it also downregulates the ACE2 uh, receptor, which is important for several other phenomena, and it causes um, loss of ACE2 uh, receptor. That's the primary uh, mechanism by which it works, and uh, this causes inflammatory responses from the body, so uh, large cytokine uh, uh, storm or release. Uh, we, of course, the body expresses a large number of antiviral factors to fight this infection, and this causes pulmonary cell infiltration. This is associated with lymphopenia, release of these uh, WBCs and loss in these. And then uh, if you have minor neutralizing antibodies coming from other coronavirus infections, this can also complicate your uh, infection because many of these will poorly bind to the virus and then uh, will en enable uh, these viruses to go and, and bind to cells which are not able to neutralize them, but then they are able to, these viruses are able to infect those cells. And this causes uh, other cellular damage, uh, even larger cytokine storms, especially IL-8 and MCP-1. And uh, that could be one of the reasons why some people are ending up with severe form of the disease. And this is something that we don't understand very well. Uh, we also know that the T-cell lymphocytes, cytotoxic lymphocytes, are very critical for this clearing this infection, but we still don't understand anything about when they work and why they don't work in other, other cases. So these are questions that are going forward that will be important to study. And uh, because immunology is such an important factor in this, um, people have been thinking about immunological therapeutics. So the second uh, line of um, um, the interventions are using uh, either broadly neutralizing antibodies, recombinant antibodies that have been cloned from recovered patients, or plasma therapy, which is taking the whole convalescent plasma uh, and using it as a source of protecting neutralizing uh, antibodies and other factors. Uh, and they both seem to be showing quite a lot of promise. So the citations are again given for this. Going forward, um, we would, of course, like to have long-term cure, and that usually means we will have to think about vaccination and immunization. Uh, and uh, we will have to, at that point, be very careful about thinking about what is the uh, appropriate immune response. As I said, uh, if you do it wrong, you can also end up with severe immunopathological uh, uh, form of the disease. So you don't want to be in a scenario like that. Uh, but we also need to be able to um, generate some sufficient immune response. And for that, uh, this is kind of becomes a hit and trial and following up on the, um, uh, the, the following up every patient as they are vaccinated. And so uh, we need rapid trials. Um, Three-phase human trials are the 
uh, the standard way of doing this. Sometimes animal trials are involved, but because of the uh, exigency, uh, many of these animal trials are being bypassed. After we have the vaccines, of course, uh, we will have to think about scaling up for manufacturing and delivering so many vaccines to a very large population. And those also uh, uh, provide challenges for us. Uh, we will also have to think about coming up with animal models very quickly because we can't wait for everybody to get infected. We'll have to test these out with animal models. And one of the reasons there are very few animal trials being done is because we don't have animal models for uh, looking at these virus, how the virus grows and what happens to vaccinations. So they are being developed as we speak. And hopefully in the next few months, we will have some of those out there. Uh, we also don't understand uh, the immunity itself from the natural infection, how long will the immunity last? Uh, as much as we know about SARS, uh, the first SARS, uh, people have found neutralizing antibodies as uh, late as 17 years post-infection. But is it sufficient to provide protection against another infection? We don't know that yet. It's something that needs to be seen and studied and seen. Okay, uh, so vaccines, uh, there are many, many different ways of making vaccines nowadays. Um, so I will start from the bottom up. Uh, so there are these protein-based vaccines, which will be viral proteins, which are combined with adju uh, adjuvants, uh, which evoke a response. And the proteins, viral proteins, are the ones which form the epitopes uh, that are recognized by the immune system, and they would uh, then train the immune response. Uh, you, uh, the more commonly used uh, and old school method is the live attenuated viruses or inactivated viruses where you take the whole virus now that you can isolate and grow them separately and you inactivate it or reduce its uh, uh, virulence by mutations or with just passaging them over a long period of time in cell culture and come up with the uh, virus. This is probably the least commonly uh, uh, used method nowadays because of the safety issues. Um, uh, more, excuse me, more um, uh, radical approaches are these uh, nucleic acid-based approaches, so RNA vaccines, which is RNA encoding the SARS proteins would be injected directly into the cells and they uh, you or DNA uh, plasmids encoding the proteins will be injected into the cells and they get into the your uh, in nucleus the uh, RNA is made or RNA is already present then the protein is made and then uh, these act as uh, your epitopes that are recognized by your immune uh, foreign immune cells. And, and of course, uh, there are other viruses that are being piggybacked. The viruses which are known to be safe uh, are piggybacked by expressing the SARS-CoV-2 proteins on their surfaces and then uh, getting them to uh, uh, infect the cells and express the antigen uh, and, and then evoke a immune response. These vaccines will now have a memory because they will activate not only your innate immune response, but also your adaptive immune response. And this is how these memory will allow you to be safeguarded. And this is how vaccines really work. So uh, we have about 138 uh, vaccine uh, being developed as we speak, and there might be more coming. Uh, and uh, I have color coded them based on the types of vaccines. So, uh, the first two, for example, are pre-existing vaccines. They are not viral vaccines, but they have been associated with um, very broad, non-specific uh, uh, protection that uh, has been shown for these vaccines against viral infections. So they are being tested. The reason they are test being tested is because they, we know that they are safe. Uh, and if they do uh, give us some protection, we know that we, can already, uh, we already have a, a stockpile of those. Uh, there are a few virus vaccines still being developed either, uh, so that's kind of in the blue. Um, and then uh, there are other uh, approaches that have been taken where we uh, take cells which are then um, um, loaded with uh, the spike proteins by um, genetically encoding them in the cells. And those cells are then intravenously used into the uh, human body and they will act to prime the adaptive immune response. And then at the bottom, you will see the RNA and the DNA vaccines that also are uh, in various stages. So you will see that these are uh, in different stages of uh, phases of uh, trials. Um, of course, phase three and phase four is only possible for the ones which are already had been there, but many of them are already in phase two. Many of the recently developed 
coronavirus specific vaccines are already in phase two uh, and uh, they haven't completed phase one yet, but they, they are already in phase two because of the promising results. So uh, if you ask me when will I see a vaccine uh, out there, that could be as early as August or September. But if you say, when will I get a vaccine, uh, that will depend on many other factors uh, which we need to see. Okay, and uh, there are some challenges that I mentioned earlier. So we have to think about how strong an immune response we need to have um, so that we are protected against uh, infection. But we also need to make sure that it is not so strong that we end up with severe cases of this immunopathological uh, uh, manifestations of this. And then we, of course, need to understand how long the vaccine-induced immunity will last. But as far as we understand, the virus is not mutating so much. So we probably don't need to worry too much about uh, uh, that aspect of it at this moment, until as we discover something new. So uh, I'll stop here. And uh, I'm sorry that I went a little overboard, but um, uh, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. So. Yeah, Dr. Rahul, it was really fantastic, wonderful presentation. I Means really very much informative. So many new information that we received today, and uh, so many those things that uh, that were asked before in our um, uh, to in our email. So I am really thankful to you to answer all most of those questions that you that were raised before. Sure. But there are a few more questions which um, it's already there in the chat. You, you want me to read them out or yeah. uh, I can do yeah. that? So first question is that please tell me, please tell uh, from Ani Ansh, uh, please tell how much time it will active on food item like package, packaged food and mm -hmm. all those kind of things. Okay, so uh, I did not include that study because it's a very famous study that came in very early in the um, um, in, in the coronavirus. So people have shown that uh, different surfaces, uh, for different surfaces, the, the life uh, of the viruses, the life for which they are active is different. Um, so the extreme cases are uh, specific metal surfaces like copper. In copper surfaces, the virus lasts only for two hours. Um, they, uh, if you, but however, if you take steel, stainless steel, uh, they will last for as long as um, um, eight hours. Okay, on plastic uh, and and foil, they would last somewhere between three to four hours. Uh, and um, if you if you are looking at cardboard, uh, they last for again two to three hours only. Okay, uh, so but the fact that we have a lot of metal surfaces like steel surfaces, you have to be careful on food packaging. Uh, depending on what kind of a packaging you have. This could be as long and as small as uh, two to eight hours. You basically have to take your guess. I would presume that you have to be careful when you are handling anything which you're handling outside. Uh, I should also point out one more thing uh, is that um, the viral load uh, matters a lot in who gets infected or not. Or you are consistently being exposed to the virus. Uh, you will, not everybody who is going to catch a virus is going to get infected. Okay, but if you see this continuously all the time, um, for example, if you're talking to somebody who is already infected, you will uh, catch your chances of catching that is much, much higher. So keep that in mind. Uh, but yes, it's, it's better to be safe uh, by cleaning of the surfaces. As you would know, detergent is a great, um, or, or soaps are a very great tool for this because these viruses have a membrane. So you can uh, dissolve this membrane in detergent very, very easily, and then the virus basically falls apart. Okay. So hopefully I answered the concern. That's been mm -hmm. So the other question is, does protease inhibitors have any role in the coronavirus? Yes, I, I showed you that the viruses are made as a long polyprotein. Uh, many of these proteins are linked together and to be able to function independently they need to be cleaved off and uh, this so the virus itself codes for two uh, different proteases uh, you saw that on the surface of the uh, of the cell uh, it needs to be cleaved the spike protein needs to be cleaved for it to be activated uh, as well as uh, inside the cell uh, before replication there are other host proteases that need to cleave 
the replicase proteins and so on uh, for it to function properly. So there are multiple sites at which protease, uh, proteases are involved and hence protease inhibitors are being used. Of course, we don't want to uh, go gung-ho on it because we want to find specific protease inhibitors which will act only on the viral uh, targets, uh, viral protease targets or, or host targets uh, which, without affecting any other function. So that's the challenge here. But in general, yes, protease inhibitors will remain one of the largest tried drugs in this case, uh, apart from uh, replicase inhibitors. So one question is uh, from Vinod. Uh, he's saying, like, can X-ray machine at airport kill uh, corona? And I'm adding uh, no, this, no. can UV as well? No, I don't believe so. The X-rays in the airports are uh, very low. Uh, dosages, uh, you you can't kill them using uh, that exposure. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And some people are also telling that uh, UV can be used for the to kill the corona. Is it true? Or yes. It yeah. So UV and heat, uh, both uh, uh, the virus is susceptible. For example, if you keep for an hour uh, at 55 degrees to 65 degrees, um, uh, the virus will get fails. So if you really want to keep keep where to you just put things outside in the sun. Mm -hmm. um, UV also does that, the same thing. Again, uh, these are standard things that people use, have been using to kill almost everything. Um, and yes, they apply. Uh, this has been shown already. Okay, that's a, that's a very information, good information. So another question from uh, Dev Sena, that, uh, uh, that most of the cases are asymptomatic. The, so does that mean that those people are quite immune and will fight the disease easily or will they have same chances of complications like other ones are showing like other ones showing the same symptoms uh, okay so uh, maybe i haven't understood the question exactly but let me try to clarify mm -hmm. so the asymptomatic uh, people do not show severe symptoms. That's why we call them asymptomatic. Yeah. They don't show any of the symptoms. They might have a very minor cough, uh, if at all. Uh, they are carrying viruses. And the, the studies that we have seen till date, uh, many of these, because it's hard to catch these asymptomatic people because they don't show any, uh, so they are not getting tested. But whatever we have seen till now, uh, they carry roughly the same amount of virus load, which means, uh, while they are not showing symptoms, uh, they might not ever end up in the hospital. They are able to trans infect anybody else who might be susceptible. Okay, what makes them asymptomatic? Why are they not showing these symptoms? Uh, uh, a very generic answer would be that their immune system worked uh, in just the right way. So it'll be interesting to study those folks and trying to see how they were able to cope with it. But as you could imagine, as you saw this age age-based case fatality rate, our immune system weaken as we become older and older. Uh, and uh, that is, could be one of the reasons why uh, the older folks are not able to clear the infection where the younger folks are. So uh, these are very, very hand-waving answers, but um, uh, that's what we believe is going on. So asymptomatic people will not develop any symptoms, but they will pass on the virus to others. Okay, okay. So we have another question from Sachin. So he's asking like uh, 100, there are hundreds of vaccine in the research and, uh, but obviously usually only um, about 10% of vaccine are, vaccines are showing a positive result. And we have only, uh, we know there are many strains which are causing the COVID-19. So what is the chances that we get immune to all of these strains if we will vaccine, we will get the vaccine, uh, or we will get the vaccinated. We will get vaccinated by a single vaccine. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, yes, uh, the virus is mutating. It is not mutating fast enough, as I said before. Uh, in fact, the most of the strains that you are talking about, they have only a few amino acid differences between each other. So the rest of the virus is exactly the same, uh, which means that most of the vaccines will work on the strains, same strains. Um, it also depends on what has been used uh, to make these uh, vaccines. For example, a protein that is a very small segment of the whole virus, if mutations happen there, then that 
a vaccine would not work so well. Um, so that needs to be seen, but people are developing different vaccines because uh, some are easier to make. Protein-based vaccines are easier to make. You can have them ready right now. mRNA-based vaccines are easier to make, whereas inactivated viruses uh, that would give you better protection, but you have to get the protection right and there is a biosafety issue. How do you ensure that it itself doesn't mutate and, and become a pathogen? So people uh, are making all, trying all these approaches. Uh, and uh, as I said before, you also don't want to have an overstimulation of the immune response because then that will, the vaccine itself will not be safe. So safety has to be tested. So yes, you are right. While many, many vaccines are being made, only a few will make it, uh, but they will make it because they are safe. Uh, they kind of give the right protection. They don't cause any other um, symptoms when you get infected the second time around. And uh, they will be able to broadly act against all the viruses. I should also mention that you might not have need 100% of in all of these factors. You have heard about this concept of herd immunity. Even if you are able to vaccinate about 60 to 70% of the uh, population, the virus will kind of die out because it doesn't find enough people to propagate to because many of them are vaccinated now. So uh, you will see vaccines being introduced even if they are not 100% in many of these categories that I mentioned. Okay. Um, so one more question is like, uh, which is very common, most of the people used to ask like, uh, uh, is it okay to keep, like suppose we go for grocery or some other stuff and we'll keep them idle for a while, like maybe for a day or two. So yeah, that should, that should do the trick. Uh, if the concentration of the virus is not very, very high, uh, number, so nobody has spat on it, uh, you, are, uh, you are quite okay. As I said, the viral load matters. The mm -hmm. larger the viral load, the longer you have to kind of let it to kill. But in general, that is a good strategy. Okay, okay. And it's easy to do, actually. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So one Ray question, just a minute. Yeah. So another question comes like uh, SE2 receptor founds on the surface of the lungs, arteries, heart, kidney, intestine. So then yes. why COVID is infecting only lungs or respiratory system? Uh, no, uh, I think uh, uh, you, it's absolutely right. In fact, uh, ACE2 receptors are present on your tongue as well. Um, they are, and I would like to argue that, uh, and I'm pretty sure there is data out there, though I haven't seen uh, all the data yet, published data yet, uh, that it is infecting your tongue as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the infection becomes kind of obvious when you have issues breathing, whereas not so much of, so, but you might have heard that people are having issues with uh, loss of smell and loss of taste, right? Uh, that is most likely happening because their tongue cells are infected. Uh, you will see that there is a lot of virus in the feces. Um, and that's happening because your intestines are infected. But the symptoms, so when you have, let's say, uh, the most uncomfortable symptoms, uh, you only focus on that and you don't focus on the others. Uh, so loss of smell and loss of, loss of taste becomes secondary when you're having breathing issues. I, I, I agree with you that other viruses, as other tissues are getting infected as well. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, nobody has carefully done that yet, but they will, they will, and you will get that data, but I'm pretty sure about that. Okay, so. Kidney I, failure, by the way, is one of the symptoms in severe cases. Um, so it is happening. Okay. So another question comes is like, what is your opinion about um, HCQ, hydrochloroquine yes. as antidote? I think we all Yeah, so data on this is very slim right now. They, uh, most of the studies that have happened uh, and bona fide studies, I should say, um, they do not show a major uh, improvement uh, in uh, as HCQ as, um, uh, when using HCQ as an antidote. Uh, you, uh, I don't think you should keep your hopes high. The reason it was uh, kind of uh, given uh, and, and 
recommended by people was because this was such a cheap drug. Uh, India manufactures a lot of it. Um, so we had it in stock already. Uh, so people said, okay, let's try it. Uh, but I don't think uh, going forward, it will become the, uh, uh, it's a very slim chances that it will become the uh, coronavirus drug. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think uh, enough of the questions and answers now. Uh, so yep. thank you. I would like to like call up the and uh, end, end of the session because yeah. So thank you, Doctor uh, Rahul Roy. It's, yeah, thank uh, you, Vijay. A very wonderful session, and thank you, Priyanka, to invite Doctor Rahul for the uh, webinar. Um, it was really wonderful and very much informative for everyone and people okay, didn't glad. Yeah, so thank you so much. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you, Priyanka. Thank you everybody for joining. Yeah.